Kristallnacht, Kidnapped to Buchenwald. This is the story of Louis Katz, a Holocaust martyr who was taken on Kristallnacht with 30,000 other Jewish men to Buchenwald concentration camp. Louis Katz was the father of Al Katz. My parents were Louis and Berta Katz. My father's family dates back into the 1500s in Germany. It is the same with my mom's family. He was drafted in World War I in 1914 and was in the German infantry until 1918. He was 36 years old when he entered the service and 40 when he returned home. He got the Iron Cross and he was in the front lines in France for the full four years. He was a private. My father was a brave man. He fought in 1914 through 1918 from the age of 36 to 40 with two children at home. Here is my father in his German army uniform. My father bought and sold cattle. In 1922 or 1923, my father was appointed distributor or commissioner for the area where we were living for the cattle. People respected him very much. I remember as a child, when we went to synagogue on Saturday or on a holiday, my father wore tails and a Sunday hat, a tall satin hat, and people were proud to know him and to speak to him. There's my father with our family, my brother Erwin on the right, my mother Berta next to my father, my older sister Ermgard to the left, and there's me in the front on the left with my little sister Ruth on the right. And this was before my little baby brother, Arthur Berner, was even born. A Dr. Wirtz spoke from Berlin and he warned, not just the Jews, but the whole world, that if Hitler would get into power, he would do exactly what he wrote in Mein Kampf. He would destroy everybody and try to conquer the world. But nobody believed him. My father came back and he said, children, this looks bad. I don't know what to make of it, but that man, what he's saying there, I cannot believe that the German people with whom I, I fought side by side and with whom I was raised all my life and my grandparents and great grandparents, they would do harm to us being German Jews. And his friends all said, oh, Louis, if he gets in, in six months, he's out. Here you see Germany during Hanukkah 1932, a menorah in the window looking out on a Nazi swastika flag on the building across the street. I remember one day in 1932, Nazis came in front of our house and they threatened my father to come down there. They wanted to kill him. When you herd cattle, you take the ox tail to herd them with. They have a knot there and on the short thin end, you have a little strap that goes around your hand. My father, my older brother, and our helper, they went down there and they showed them who they were going to be killing. My father was not a tall man, but he hit. And the next day, you saw a lot of Nazis walking around with bandaged heads. We were never afraid. My father was highly respected. Even the judges told him, Louis, if they want to come to your house, have a good sharp ax behind the door and do whatever you want to do. You're not going to go to jail. A lot of these judges were later replaced by Nazis. In 1933, after Hitler came to power in January, the Nazis began organizing boycotts of Jewish shops placing stormtroopers in front and warning the German people not to buy from Jews. Here's another picture of my family a few years later with my father on the right and my mother. 
my little sister Ruth, now grown up, and my baby brother, Arthur Werner. And this is the only surviving picture of Arthur Werner Camp. Here's the essay, The Stormtroopers Marching Through Berlin in 1938, warning the people not to buy from Jews. I saw the synagogue burned down on Kristallnacht. The walls were six feet thick. They couldn't get it down because of the walls. You wouldn't believe how it was built. They had to detonate it. Hundreds of synagogues burned across Germany on Kristallnacht, November 1938. Germans attacked Jewish shops breaking all the plate glass. And that's why the day was known as Kristallnacht, Night of the Broken Glass. All across Germany, the shops were broken in and looted. When they took my father on Kristallnacht, they picked up all the adult men. I went through the back window to escape. I came back at night. My father was gone. I couldn't help it. I was 18 when Kristallnacht happened. My father was taken away that day to Buchenwald. We got him out of Buchenwald after two weeks. 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up all over Germany on Kristallnacht and marched to concentration camps. guarded by stormtroopers. Marching down the streets so all the non-Jewish Germans could watch. Some were forced to carry signs. Others were herded into trucks. All lined up to go to concentration camps wearing overcoats because it was cold in November. Hundreds marching through streets of cities across Germany. Men and women dragged in. Jews forced to bend over to do a show for the Nazis. Jews forced to stand in the snow outside for hours. No gloves, no hats. German prisoners arrive at Sachsenhausen concentration camp after Kristallnacht. A guard tower and barracks at Sachsenhausen. Sachsenhausen prisoners at forced labor. The men forced to trade in their suits and overcoats for striped prisoner uniforms. Sachsenhausen prisoners return from slave labor. Thousands of Jewish men forced to line up in rows in the concentration camp. Endless men forced into concentration camps because they were Jews. My father never spoke about Buchenwald, except he said that when they were herded in there, the Nazis were standing on both sides. They had to walk through a line and they had boards with nails on them. They had to dodge them in order not to get hurt. In a meeting of top Nazis on November 12th, 1938, three days after Kristallnacht, Hermann Goering announced, I have received a letter written on the Fuhrer's orders requesting that the Jewish question be now, once and for all, coordinated and solved 
one way or another. This is a memorial in Hanover, Germany, where my family lived, memorializing the Jews that had been, de that had been deported from Hanover to concentration camps during the Holocaust. My older brother, Ervin, was already in America. He obtained papers for us to come to America. With these papers, we got my father out of the concentration camp after two weeks. He never spoke about it. With the papers, he went to the American consulate. The consuls were advised to make it difficult for Jews to get out of the country not by the Germans, but by the U.S. government. My father came to Hamburg, to the American consul. He was not able to see the consul because a German SS trooper was his bodyguard. He couldn't get past him. There was no hope. He said, I couldn't see the consulate. Why? An SS trooper is his bodyguard. I couldn't go past him. He wouldn't let me see him. And my father was in tears. It was the first time I'd seen that. When the day of release arrives, the concentration camp prisoner is told, you are not released. You are only on leave. The arm of the Gestapo is long. You are forbidden to recount in the slightest, to anyone, what you have experienced or seen. You are forbidden to show your body to anyone. Otherwise, you will lose your life. Our international organization is sufficiently large and powerful to carry out your punishment anywhere in the world. There are people whose look speaks of the fear of death when they open their lips. Dread resonates in their words when they are able to free their hearts from experiences that are almost impossible to render in human language. They are prisoners released from German concentration camps. My father was arrested on Kristallnacht. My father was in Buchenwald until December, about four or five weeks. Then he was released because he was a war veteran. He had the Iron Cross. He was in sad shape when he came home. I am sure he was beaten. It took him quite a while to recover after he came home. It was winter time. I remember his feet were frostbitten. Then he was no more or less convinced that there was no future and he took steps to emigrate. But by that time it was too late. I know to get an American visa or American papers in January, there's a waiting list. I still remember our number. It was 44,444. So I can never forget that number. The testimony of Herbert Lindemeyer, sounding so much like my father's story, who was also taken to, taken to Buchenwald on Kristallnacht. Testimony of Susan Neulander Faulkner, who witnessed Kristallnacht and saw the Germans laughing as the buildings were burning. The Dearborn Independent, owned by auto magnate Henry Ford, a fierce anti Semite who published the whole series that he called the international Jew, the world's problem. Henry Ford said, the Jew is the world's enigma, poor in his masses, yet he controls the world's finances. Scattered abroad without country or government, he yet presents a unity of race continuity which no other people has achieved. Living under legal disabilities in almost every land, he has become the power behind many a throne. Henry Ford, 
known for building cars, built anti-Semitism across the country and across the world. Hitler himself had a framed photograph of Henry Ford in his office. Father Charles Coughlin, a radio priest in the 1930s, commanded a weekly radio audience that eventually reached 90 million listeners. Father Coughlin, on the right, on the cover of Time magazine. In 1938, the same year as Kristallnacht, Coughlin stepped up his anti-Semitic rhetoric, rhetoric considerably. On December 5th, 1938, an article entitled Background for persecution ran in social justice under Coughlin's byline. The article appears to have been lifted almost verbatim from the translation of Goebbels's 1935 Nuremberg speech. In Boston and elsewhere, anti-Jewish incitement was fueled by Father Charles Coughlin, the founder of hate radio. Although he was based in Michigan, Coughlin's largest following was in Boston, where members of his Christian front heeded the priest's calls to organize boycotts and mass mailings against Jews. When we get through with the Jews in America, they'll think the treatment they received in Germany was nothing, said Coughlin. Coughlin's largely Irish-American adherents earned Boston the moniker, the poisonous city. In neighborhoods throughout Boston, roving gangs of teens attacked Jews and vandalized their property. According to contemporary accounts, Irish Catholic gangs organized Jew hunts, entering Jewish neighborhoods to attack young Jews. Sometimes up to half a dozen thugs would pile out of a car and pounce on a Jewish student catching him by surprise. Historians already know that Germany's Consul General in Boston was an SS officer and friend of Heinrich Himmler, architect of the Holocaust. As the Reich's top diplomat in New England, Herbert Schultz hung a large swastika flag outside his office on Beacon Hill. Even after Boston police shut down the Christian front in 1942, violence against Jews intensified during each year of the war. A generation of anti-Jewish incitement had been ingrained in every level of society, from Harvard University's pro-Nazi president to adolescent boys racking up their count of Jew hunt victims. In October of 1943, one such gang severely beat two Jewish boys, Jacob Hondas and Harvey Blaustein. Upon arriving on the scene, law enforcement arrested the Jewish adolescents and brought them to Station 11, where Boston police officers beat them with rubber hoses. Even after these affronts, a judge ruled against the victims and fined them. Even today, anti-Semitism rears its ugly head across Europe. A statement by Rabbi Meir Bar Hen, the chief rabbi of Catalonia, Spain in 2017. Jews are not here permanently. I tell my congregants, don't think we're here for good. And I encourage them to buy property in Israel. This place is lost. Don't repeat the mistake of the Algerian Jews of Venezuelan Jews. Better get out early than late. Europe is lost. Radical Islamists are living among you. It's very difficult to get rid of them. They only get stronger. Al Katz. 
himself a Holocaust survivor, said, I still believe in God. If there wouldn't have been a God, none of us would be alive. We were supposed to survive to tell about it. We were given a chance to survive, very few of us. When I walk to work every day in slave labor, I've always been proud to be a Jew. I prayed with my own words, and I think that's what helped me get through that thing. Here we see a photograph showing the Jews of yesterday and the Jews of today. The Jews of yesterday in concentration camp uniforms, prisoners, and the Jews of today, members of the Israeli Defense Forces in their military uniforms, proud and free. Am Yisrael Chai. The people of Israel live. 